So we have an excellent panel this afternoon. Um, actually, uh, our first speaker is Dr. David Blumenthal. His topic today will be on health maintenance when you have lupus. Dr. Blumenthal is a board certified rheumatologist in the Division of Rheumatology at University Hospital of Cleveland and is the Assistant Professor of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. So I'm gonna let Dr. Blumenthal take the virtual floor as I just navigate back over to control. So Dr. Blumenthal, thank you. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Um, and I would like to thank the Greater Ohio Chapter of the Lupus Foundation for extending the invitation to all of us today to participate in today's really excellent program. Um, Leslie, do we have the first slide, please? Thank you. So today, um, we're going to talk about supportive care for people with lupus. Uh, next slide, please. And first, I should explain what I even mean by that. And uh, as lupus patients know very well, when you get together with your rheumatologist, a lot of the discussion is about how your lupus has been doing, whether you perceive that you've been having flare flares recently or anything else that seems to be going wrong. Uh, how is it going with the medicines? Are they working? Are they making you sick? Is it time for laboratory tests? What did the laboratory tests from last time show? And what sort of laboratory tests are gonna be done this time? And a lot of the focus is sort of on the nuts and bolts of medicines for lupus, how the lupus is doing, how we're going to assess how we're doing with the lupus that day. But sometimes we forget that there's a lot of other things going on that are not specifically lupus related. And what I would call supportive care is medical advice that leads to better health for people with lupus that is not specifically part of the whole discussion about your lupus medicines and whether you've had recent lupus flares and what testing is going to be done that day. Next slide, please. So, the uh sorry dr blumenthal it's just loading a second no writing is this the correct slide yes it is so general health recommendations that apply to everyone in american life apply even more if you have lupus uh, cigarette smoking and other exposure to tobacco smoke is really not very good for lupus. So if you, anyone with lupus who's a current smoker, I would encourage them to start a smoking cessation program so that they are soon going to be a non-smoker. If you're exposed to tobacco smoke in the home, you might talk to other people in the home about smoking cessation for them or um, perhaps doing you the favor of not smoking when you're around because being exposed to the tobacco smoke is really not all that good. Try to achieve and maintain a healthy body weight just like everyone else. There is a measure that tracks how your body weight is doing compared to your height. That's called the BMI. And as your BMI goes up, it's not good for your health. And so proper eating and getting proper exercise and being attentive to how you're doing with your body weight is ultimately going to help you and get regular physical exercise. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Just lacing up your shoes and going out the door and going for a walk is perfectly fine. You don't have to necessarily jog or lift weights. Now, it turns out that having lupus is a risk factor by itself for clogging of arteries, heart attacks, and strokes. So what can you do? Well, one of the obvious things to do is to work with your rheumatologist to take good care of the lupus. If you're on prednisone, try to get the prednisone dose down to as low as you can. But there are other things that everyone else does to prevent heart attacks and strokes that would be relevant to you. For example, you should get your blood, check, blood pressure checked regularly. And if your blood pressure is running high, you should talk to your doctor about blood pressure medicine so that that risk factor for a heart attack or stroke is under control. Everyone else gets their cholesterol checked 
And when you have lupus, it's especially important to get your cholesterol checked. High LDL, which is called the bad cholesterol, is something you don't want. Low HDL, HDL being called the good cholesterol, is something you actually do, you actually want HDL, and if it's low, that can be a concern too. And triglycerides also have uh, a risk of their own. So you'd want to get your lipid profile checked. It's often done in a fasting state at the start of the day when you're when you're just at, out of the house, and your doctor will talk to you about whether they have any concerns about your cholesterol testing or whether it looks good. If you're a diabetic good control of the diabetes is really important. And making sure that you and your doctors don't overdo the prednisone would be a good idea too, because prednisone can turn people who were not diabetic before into a diabetic, and that's going to increase your risk of having trouble with, say, heart attacks or strokes. Now, one of the causes of strokes in lupus is some people have a clotting disorder, and their blood clots very easily. Sometimes this is called the antiphospholipid syndrome, and some people are on rather strong blood thinners for this. Well, one of the reasons that the strong blood thinners are necessary is so that you don't have a blood clot in your leg that could travel to your lungs, or that you don't have a blood clot in your heart that could lead to a future stroke. So anybody who is supposed to be on blood thinners, it's really important to work with your doctor to make sure that these are properly adjusted, and that way you'll be protecting yourself against a future stroke. Next slide, please. Now, what about skin health? Everyone with lupus knows that they've got to be careful with the sun. And the strongest sun of the year is coming up pretty soon. It's not necessarily the hottest day of the year. June 21st is the strongest sun of the year. And each month before June 21st and after June 21st, June 21st is a high-risk time for skin rashes due to lupus. Because if you have lupus, especially if you're a light-skinned person with lupus, you've got to be careful about sun exposure. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, the UV index is uh, in the paper on cleveland.com every day uh, for the weather report, and you can find out how sunny it is supposed to be that day. And one of the things you can do is just plain manage what you're going to do outside that day. Maybe being out in the middle of the day at noon is not such a good idea. Maybe you can do the same outside task at four o'clock or five o'clock in the afternoon rather than at noon when the sun is not so strong. Using sunscreens is very important and remember to reapply if a little bit of sweating has started to dilute away the sunscreen and make sure that you have sun protective clothing like hats and uh, garments that let the air through but keep the sun out. Now when you take medicine for lupus there is a chance that your immune system is going to be weak and uh, in the environment we're in right now with COVID-19, this is coming up a lot when lupus patients talk to their doctors. So you and your doctor should work together so that if you suspect that you're coming down with infection, that you get the right advice. Um, everybody, before they take strong medicine for lupus, should be checked for tuberculosis. Nowadays, it's a simple blood test. Back in the day, they used to poke your skin with a little needle and do the skin test for TB. Either, either of them is okay, but a blood test is more common nowadays. And if there's any sign that you might have been exposed to, for, to TB, you might have to take TB medicine for a little while to protect yourself. Uh, blood testing is available for past exposure to hepatitis B, hepatitis C, or the HIV virus. And if you have any of these things, it will be important for you and your doctor to work together so that you can take lupus medicine safely, even though you've been exposed to those viruses. And in general, we do recommend annual vaccines. I know vaccines are controversial in some quarters, but most doctors, you will notice, are not anti-vaxxers. Most doctors are actually very much in favor of vaccines. Um, and we do recommend that folks with lupus, especially if you take medicine that makes your immune system weak, that you get the annual flu vaccine, uh, that you get the uh, the two different pneumococcal vaccines, sometimes called the pneumonia vaccine, and get boosters when uh, every five years or so. Uh, you might consider getting vaccination for shingles. Nowadays, uh, there is a safer vaccine out that's fine for anybody to take. 
And for lupus patients who are under age 26 and have never been vaccinated for HPV, human papilloma virus, and which we'll talk about more in a second, you might consider going and getting the vaccine. In general, uh, 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 if you're older than age 26, the, ja the vaccine is not all that helpful at that point. Uh, but if you're uh, 26 or under and you have not ever had the vaccine, you might want to talk to your doctor about it. Next slide, please. I apologize. Now, oh, thank you. The, the slides are a little slow, Leslie, but it's fine. So uh, everyone who takes Plaquenil for their lupus, which is hydroxychloroquine, a medicine that has been in the news a lot lately, uh, knows that they got to go to the eye doctor every year. And if their eye doctor tells them to come more often than that, you should absolutely do what your eye doctor instructs you to do. And that's to make sure that the medicine doesn't have any harmful effects in your, on your eyes. Other things to check for are cataracts, which are going to occur in the lens of the eye as we all get older and we're exposed to sunlight, but it also, cataracts can also come from prednisone use. So having your doctor check you for cataracts, which can make your vision blurry, sort of like having a dirty windshield, is a good thing. They can also check you for glaucoma. There are some people whose eyes are very sensitive to prednisone. And sometimes the prednisone can cause the pressure in your eye to go up. And high pressure inside the eye is what glaucoma is, and it's bad for your vision. So your eye doctor will check you for that, and paying attention to ocular health is important. Next slide, please. Now, 90% of patients with lupus are women. So I imagine quite a few of the attendees at today's seminar are women. Um, and there are a number of women's health issues that come up th that uh, you need to know about if you have lupus. So first of all, is pregnancy safe in lupus? It absolutely is. But we recommend that the pregnancy be planned because it's best if the pregnancy take place when your lupus is under good control. And sometimes an unplanned or surprise pregnancy can ha happen when your lupus is not well controlled. And that can be risky for you and also for the baby. Now, in order to have a pregnancy when it's planned, you would want to have a good method of birth control for the times in your life when you're not planning to become pregnant. And then the birth control will be discontinued after discussions with your doctor when you're ready to start a family. Pap smears and HPV testing are very important. HPV is the human papilloma virus. So why is this virus important? Because almost all of the cases of cervical cancer are caused by this virus. It very rarely happens to people who have never encountered the HPV virus. And that's why they're immunizing boys and girls at approximately age 11 to 12, and quite often prior to age 15. And if that is done widely throughout the United States, it's possible that in the future, we're gonna see cervical cancer start to disappear from the life of American women. But many uh, women in today's audience and many women in the United States came of age when there wasn't any vaccine. And knowing whether you personally have had HPV infection in the past or now, and knowing that your pap smears look good is very important to preventing um, a cervical cancer if you are of an age that you never would have gotten the vaccine because they hadn't invented the vaccine yet. And if your pap smears are abnormal, which can be from having the virus and being on lupus medicine, the virus is kept in check by your immune system. When you make your immune system weak with lupus medicine, that is necessary to prevent lupus flares, but it might cause the virus to go a little crazy and cause abnormal pap smears and a lot of concern about cervical cancer. So you want to see your OBGYN provider Make sure you get preventative testing, pap smears, HPV testing to know what your risk is and follow up with your doctor if your pap smears are, are abnormal. It's really important so that this is not turned into cervical cancer. Now, for women who are age 26 or less and who have never been vaccinated, consider getting yourself vaccinated. And of course, all women should get ma uh, mammograms according to the current recommendations. Next slide, please.
Okay. Well, you probably heard that going through menopause and being postmenopausal can lead to loss of the strength of your bones. You probably heard that being on prednisone is bad for your bones. So what do you do to keep your bones healthy? Because if you don't, you're going to get osteoporosis and your bones are going to start breaking, even if what you just did would not ordinarily break a bone. Well, make sure you get the recommended daily allowance of calcium and vitamin D a day. I would say 1,000 milligrams of calcium to 500 milligram pills if you want, um, and 800 units of vitamin D every day is probably a good idea. Make sure you get weight-bearing exercise. Swimming is actually not going to build up bones very much, even though it's excellent exercise. But walking around is weight-bearing exercise, and that would work. Um, you and your doctor would want to check your vitamin D levels from time to time. In the Great Lakes region, where it's cloudy for much of the year, many of us become low on vitamin D. And your doctor will recommend supplements if your vitamin D is running low. And for women who are postmenopausal, or if you've had a fracture that nobody was expecting, uh, discuss with your doctor getting a bone density scan. If you want to know if your blood pressure is high, somebody's going to have to measure your blood pressure. If you want to know if you're at risk for osteoporosis, somebody's going to have to measure your bone density. And it's a simple test that's very similar to an x-ray. Next slide, please. Now, the final thing to discuss is the lupus medicines and the visits to your doctor. I would say the many of the people that I've met who are really struggling to get their lupus under control, they were having problems staying on their medicine for a lot of reasons, and they were having problems keeping up with their doctor visits. And if you are facing these challenges, you have to realize that sometimes doctors forget about the rest of your life. When you're in the office and the doctor is droning away and saying, I want you to do this, I want you to do this, I want you to do this, a lot of people know that what the doctor is suggesting is going to be really difficult to do. But they don't say anything because the doctor's the doctor and they, should, they feel that they should just listen quietly. Well, I would suggest that if what the doctor has suggested is just not realistic for you or for your family, I would suggest saying, hey, doc, uh, see, we have this problem. To get to your office, I got to ride three buses, and I can't be coming every two months if because it's so difficult. Or the medicines that you're recommending, I just don't see how I'm going to do that. And the reasons why people might not be able to take their medicine are sometimes it's just too expensive. The coverage they get from their insurance does not cover enough of the cost and they really can't afford it. Sometimes what their doctor has suggested is just too darn complicated and keeping track of all of that is almost impossible. Sometimes there are concerns about side effects or medication interactions with other things that you might be taking. Sometimes the doctor did not good, do a good job of explaining why the medicine was important. And some people have a preference for alternative medical treatments, treatments that involve adjustment of the diet or taking of herbs or other dietary supplements. If you see any of these things as being a reason why you're probably not going to implement the plan that you and your doctor discussed that day, my advice would be be totally honest about it and just tell your doctor, yeah, that sounds like a great plan, doc, but I don't see how I'm going to do that or any of the reasons uh, that we might have discussed. Next slide, please. I think I, that might be the end. That's the end. So I thank you for listening. And I believe, Leslie, I'm, a bit, I'm going to be available for questions right now and also later. Yes. So thank you so much. I have a couple here. And uh, very happy to see we have about 100 people attending. So as the questions are are all rolling in. We're opening up the side panel. You can use your um, comment section in the box to your right to submit some questions. Um, but I have some questions here as they're rolling in. Um, I'm a lupus patient under the age of 50. What age should I get my shingles vaccine? Can we answer that? Yeah, this is a, this is a little bit controversial um, because 
the recommendations for the general population don't always exactly apply to folks with lupus. In general, uh, the people get the shingles vaccine at around age 65. Because as, the, as we all get older, our immune system ages, we can't keep viruses under control. It turns out that shingles is the chicken pox virus that we all got when we were five years old that went into hiding inside our body. And as we get older and our um, immune system gets weak, the virus can come back out. Well, it can come back out in people who are young if they're on lupus medicines. And so some doctors are recommending that people get the shingles vaccine at a younger age. But sometimes your insurance company is not expecting this. And so when they see, they know how old you are because you're in their computer as being of a certain age and they see that your doctor is requesting this. And sometimes they, it does not match the guidelines that they have in their computer of what they're willing to pay for. And sometimes you end up getting into a discussion about it. So it's something that each person with lupus should discuss with their rheumatologist or their, their lupus team and figure out what really is the best thing for them. Okay, great. Um, another question here is, is it true that secondhand smoke will decrease the effectiveness of my Plaquenil? We've done some talks about how smoking is bad with Plaquenil, but can secondhand yeah. smoke? Well, I would say secondhand smoke is kind of like being a smoker yourself. It, it depends on a lot of things. How heavy a smoker the other person in the room happens to be. What sort of ventilation you have in the room, how close you are to the cigarette smoke. It's really, it really varies a lot. But if you're in a house where a person walks in from outside and they immediately can smell the cigarette smoke, that's probably not an ideal environment for anyone with lupus. Now, I don't want to get anybody in any fights with people in their house. If you tell people in the middle of winter that you don't want smoking in the house and they got to go out in the cold, I don't know what they're going to think of that suggestion. So you need to have a discussion about it and uh, rather than an argument at the time that somebody is smoking. Uh, but if you get what is sort of how it works is the person in the room might smoke a pack a day and you might get the equivalent of a couple of cigarettes a day in your own lungs just by being in the room and in general, it's best not to do that. Leslie? I think it's, she may be having some technical issues. Okay. Does anyone else, uh, while well, Leslie is working through the technical issues, um, does anyone else have access to any of the questions? Uh, Dr. Blumenthal, can you hear me? I can. Hi, this is Adrian. Um, I'm going to take over for a moment for Leslie. Um, I do know there was one other question uh, that was pre-submitted. Um, one of the things that we know our patients were interested in is that if they're, I apologize, my, my dog is here. Um, if, they're do, if their doctor wants to see them virtually because of coronavirus, when is a virtual appointment not appropriate for a lupus patient? Yeah, this has been a tricky issue. Um, I've been doing virtual appointments myself. Uh, most of us have. And we're willing to do it any time one of our patients requests it. And at the peak of the concern a few weeks back when everybody was really sheltered down, um, we did mostly virtual visits and very few office visits. I'd say the problem it poses for me is when I need to see something, it's especially hard to assess joints over the, uh, over the video link. Um, and I, it's really hard for me to see just what's going on in somebody's joints, even if they hold them up to the camera. Sometimes it can be hard to uh, figure out what's going on with a certain rash. When the dermatologists do this, they get really good cameras uh, as often as they can. And um, they get pretty good pictures. Sometimes with the equipment that, that you and I might own, Sometimes the picture quality isn't really good enough for us to be able to figure out from a distance what's going on. But a lot of it we can, we can do. 
And so an in-depth conversation about uh, whether you're having lupus flares recently and me on my end entering blood and urine tests into the computer and you might uh, drop by the lab at a time when it's not expected to be busy and just very quickly get those things done, we can do a pretty good assessment of where we're at with your lupus and see if your medicines need to be adjusted. Thank you. I appreciate that, Dr. Blumenthal. I think Leslie is back with us, so I think she's going to take over. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, it's the world of the virtual meetings here, and uh, <laughs> who knows what's going to happen. Um, you know, Dr. Blumenthal, I think thank you for your presentation. Um, just to keep rolling, if you could keep around, and maybe we can answer some questions uh, towards the end. Absolutely. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you very much for your presentation, and I apologize for uh, going in and out. But uh, we'll get the program continuing to go here. So uh, thank you again. OK, well, our next speaker is Dr. Van Warren. Uh, his topic will be on medications used in the treatment of lupus. Dr. Van Warren is a board certified rheumatologist in the Division of Rheumatology at University Hospital of Cleveland and a, a professor of medicine at Case Western Reserve as well. Uh, Dr. Van Warren has a pre uh, presentation he's presented for us, and I'll give you the floor, Dr. Warren. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank everybody for allowing me to come to, uh, to this virtual meeting today. This is a little bit unusual for me and probably for a lot of other people, but I want to try to at least kind of bring into uh, perspective the different types of medicines that we try to use to treat uh, various conditions with lupus. And uh, some of these medicines were mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. One of them, uh, it's kind of hard to mention any medicine about lupus and, and forget about talking about prednisone. Now, uh, prednisone is probably one of the uh, initial medicines of, aside from aspirin or one of the initial medicines we use to treat various uh, arthritic conditions or painful conditions. You know, that uh, one of the big things that I always like to uh, mentioned when we start talking about these things that, that I want people to, uh, to not uh, feel that they're just going blind or something like that because the light is just shown, but that's that, uh, you know, that uh, prednisone has a, a fairly unique um, uh, uh, structure, and it's, a, and it's a structure that, uh, uh, that mimics uh, uh, our cortisol, our natural occurring uh, uh, a chemical in the body, uh, that uh, cortisol is actually part of the adrenal um, uh, and uh, pituitary axis. The more cortisol you make, the, the lower the, uh, the hormones that you make, like which is uh, that helps you to simulate the, uh, the production of cortisol. Uh, the lower the amount or less amount of cortisol you make, the more your pituitary has to, to work to try to make more cholesterol or make more uh, cortisol. And so that by giving uh, uh, prednisone, we're kind of uh, uh, interrupting that uh, that uh, cycle, and that uh, we're giving it to you uh, uh, by an uh, uh, unnatural way in terms of by mouth rather than your body producing it on its own. And so one of the problems that sometimes happen is once a patient has been on a large dose of prednisone or on prednisone for for, for, lack of, for, for prolonged periods of time, it makes it very difficult for the body to start remaking its own cortisol if you suddenly stop taking your prednisone. I can recall of one patient suddenly stopping his prednisone on his own on two different occasions, and both times he lost consciousness and passed out. Uh, I asked him that the second time if he didn't learn his lesson the first time. And so I wanted to try to prevent anyone else from doing that. We wanted to, we wanted to uh, come off of prednisone, we want to gradually do it in a, in a, a organized fashion. Uh, that uh, prednisone is a, a, of its own is actually a, a, a a medicine that really is not effective, does, it doesn't really work at all because it has to go through your liver and get converted to methylprednisolone, which is the active form of the, of the medication. So because of this, for one reason, why the prednisone may take at least about a day before it uh, starts to work because of that reason. But in large doses, prednisone, um, or not prednisone, uh, methylprednisolone uh, byproduct, or cortisol, which is, uh, can be given intravenously or orally, uh, uh, gets into the cell membrane uh, with almost no problem at all. It just penetrates that membrane of the cell. And because of that, it can start to interfere with uh, 
well, especially NF kappa B, one of the chemicals that, that are inside the cells help to stimulate or cause inflammation. So prednisone is an excellent drug for, uh, for rapidly trying to reduce inflammation in a hurry. Uh, but it has its own side effects of, uh, in addition to the side effect of, uh, of uh, lowering your production of your natural cortisol. They also can uh, increase blood pressure, cause fluid retention, and co uh, long term can cause a uh, hardening of the arteries or atherosclerotic disease, glaucoma, cataracts, or diabetes. And so it's a, it's a, a drug that many people love to hate. Uh, but particularly, I think that most people are. are this, uh, don't like prednisone because of the weight gain problem that many people may get. Um, you know, prednisone is a, uh, uh, is a drug that I, I think is an excellent drug if you can use it for short periods of time for acute attacks and then try to get off of it or at least on the lowest dose that we can get away with. Um, other uh, medications that have been used for lupus as well as some other uh, inflammatory arthritis is hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is, a, is a, I think, an excellent drug. It's a, it's a slow drug. It takes in place between three and six months to really work for many people, but it, uh, it does tend to stabilize the, uh, some called a lysozymes, or there are, that are uh, lysosomes, as you say, inside of the cell so that, that uh, so they don't release those chemicals that kind of produce the inflammation. It also tends to uh, trap what we call free radicals that are floating around, that may be floating around in your uh, bloodstream. And it uh, suppress, suppresses the T cell function so that the T cells don't stimulate the B cells to become active and produce the antibodies. It may have some other uh, functions as well. And one function is that uh, for some reason it tends to lower uh, the lipids in some people. It's not a very potent lipid lowering drug, but it may, uh, uh, some people think that it may potentially over a long period of time lessen the risk for hardening of the arteries because of that. But I think that's uh, uh, to be a way to be seen. But uh, I wanted to point out, uh, if everybody can see it, the structure of hydroxychloroquine. But the big thing I wanted to, uh, to mention is that through all of these drugs that we're going to talk about, is you, you'll see that their cell, uh, their uh, chemical structure has a lot of similarities. And, it's that the, and I think that the, these drugs are, are, are basically getting into your system and trying to uh, mimic what the natural chemicals that your body would be making. And because of this, it interferes with the production of those uh, cytokines that have to produce uh, uh, inflammatory products. This is that uh, the Plaquenil is, uh, it has some potential side effects in some people. Uh, probably the uh, common side effects are the headaches and the uh, blurring of vision. Sometimes you have trouble seeing it in the uh, in dark, or is seeing different colors, or recognizing colors. Uh, the uh, intestinal problems like diarrhea, abdominal pain. You know the uh, dizziness, ringing in the ears. You know this it has some potential side effects. But many times, if those side effects are small or minor, they may uh, uh, diminish over time, without doing anything else. Uh, the we, uh, as was mentioned before, you like to have your eyes checked at least on an annual basis uh, or, or as often as the uh, ophthalmologist may recommend because um, one effect of uh, Plaquenil that's an irreversible side effect is that uh, uh, macular degeneration, that uh, the, the macula or the, the retinal part of the eye starts to thin out in some people over time and the ophthalmologist can recognize that either from direct slit examination or by uh, 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 MRI or, or other scanning of the eye. And this, uh, I'm trying to demonstrate this on this picture, but basically as time goes, uh, I don't know if you can still see me, as time goes, uh, that uh, the retina may start to thin out. Generally, we don't see that effect happening within the first five years, generally after five years. And, and one study, it shows that it happens about 1% every five to 10, uh, every five to seven years after that. And so in other words, if you've been on prednisone, I'm not prednisone, but uh, hydroxychloroquine for uh, 30 years, you still only have maybe about 3% uh, risk of that uh, happening. But if you're that 3%, uh, you wanna be sure that you get checked out for that because this is an irreversible side effect. Uh, one of the other uh, medications that we sometimes use is a medicine called uh, um, uh, methotrexate, and if you can see at uh, the top and the, behind me there is that the, 
the, the chemical structure on the top is folic acid. And it's, and if you look, uh, I'm going this up just a little bit higher, you know, the chemical structure of, of methotrexate is very similar to folic acid, so it can help, uh, you know, try to interfere with your body's metabolism of, of folic acid by, you know, some different chemical means. But, uh, but why would we want to do that is that, um, you know, that methotrexate is a, is a chemotherapy a medication. But uh, it does seem to be very effective in reducing that uh, 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 production of inflammatory uh, molecules from those uh, cells. And uh, but it uh, it's a I would say a very non-selective medication, so it's not limited to just uh, your white blood cells or your uh, 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 liver cells or your lungs. Things like that it can affect any of those organs. Uh, the, Fortunately, that methotrexate doesn't tend to penetrate the uh, blood-brain uh, barrier unless you inject it uh, directly into the spinal canal or, or into the brain, it's, which is sometimes done in some people with lymphoma affecting the uh, spinal cord or the brain. But uh, uh, methotrexate, uh, uh, in one study like from, from my old alma mater uh, at Ohio State University, one of the uh, professors there actually uh, uh, wrote a paper about methotrexate being used in uh, steroid resistant or other chemical re uh, resistant lupus. Uh, it's not a drug that I would probably uh, pick for people that have kidney uh, uh, problems because that uh, a lot of the metabolites are excreted by the kidney. And if it uh, accumulates in your blood, it can have a, a very serious toxic effects. Uh, some people uh, develop a, a lung toxicity from it, which can all get all the way from uh, like a hypersensitivity, a reaction of, you know, with uh, coughing and uh, shortness of breath, to all the way to a uh, scarring of the lung or, or pulmonary fibrosis. So we do have to be careful with that medicine. We need to be monitored uh, uh, laboratory-wise because of liver uh, effects or red blood cell effects, white blood cell effects. I uh, cause bone marrow suppression because of that. So we want to, so we do have to monitor people for that. Uh, that uh, 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 the, the another medicine that actually become uh, more popular recently is that um, uh, uh, is, uh, the, I don't think you can see this very well, but uh, 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 mycophenolate and mycophenolate seems to be very helpful for uh, many people that have. Uh, uh, organ system involvement of lupus, particularly the kidney. And it, uh, it became more popular because it seems to have uh, a, a better side effect profile than some of the other medicines that were being used, particularly cyclophosphamide in the past. Uh, uh, mycophenolate uh, uh, has some uh, toxic side effects as well in terms of um, we have to be careful for monitoring people uh, uh, for uh, 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 some type of brain effects that sometimes may happen in, in people. This that uh, uh, that uh, PML or uh, uh, in terms of uh, if you have uh, many people like to check to see if they have the some called Creutzfeldt Jacobs virus because if you have that virus and you take medicines like mycophenolate or some of the other chemotherapeutic medicines that we use, there, there's a, a chance of developing some called progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, uh, which if you remember the mad cow's disease in the, in the past, uh, that uh, it can all a similar uh, condition can happen in, in humans as well. Uh, that uh, 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 other medicine that I like to, uh, to bring about, that that's uh, before we get to the end of the, these slides that uh, yeah, if you have very excellent vision, you'll be able to see. Is this the, there's a, a micro, uh, uh, the last one was mycophenolate. This is cyclophosphamide. This is a, probably the classic drug that was used uh, in, the, in the past for patients that had uh, uh, severe organ system damage, particularly the brain and the, and the kidney, because it, it was a very effective drug in terms of uh, 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 stopping the inflammatory condition by basically uh, causing a, a alkylation of the DNA inside of the cells so that the, the messenger RNA as it passes through it reduces its ability to transcribe new DNA. And this is that, uh, and it can lead to that particular cell dying. Uh, it turns out that this is also a non-selective drug, so it, uh, it can kill other cells too, not only the ones that you want to uh, uh, destroy, so you have to be very careful with this medicine. This this medicine uh, I remember was very uh, uh, caustic. So if it uh, it was given uh, if it was given intravenously and it was, and you had a, a, a poor IV, that, that that medicine were leaking to the skin. It can cause uh, sloughing of your skin. It was very corrosive to the skin. Uh, 
but, but it was a very effective drug. So what some people are, are doing now because of how quickly it works is they may give you a, a start this medicine first and then switch to mycophenolate sometime later. But uh, this one, I wanted to show that this drug is a, a somewhat novel drug compared to the other drug that we that I've mentioned before, that uh, its, its chemical structure is slightly different, although it has that that phenol ring at the at the bottom of, of the slide here, but it's that uh, but uh, it can get inside of the DNA very quickly instead of the of the cell, and it turns out it's also if it's given orally, it's also rapidly absorbed as well. So it's a it's a very effective medicine that tends to go very rapidly. Uh, the last one that I think that we oh, don't want to neglect, and that is uh, been listed. This uh, is a, a slide that was actually taken from the. Uh, 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 brochure that's on the internet about uh, uh, Benlista. And it basically it's a, a medicine that uh, tends to uh, block one of the cytokines that uh, uh, B cells uh, produce. And it's the uh, B lymphocyte stimulator factor. So that allows these B cells that are uh, abnormal to uh, proliferate and to uh, uh, continue or live longer than what they should. And this, uh, this one tends to block those uh, uh, B cells that with the uh, with uh, uh, CD8 or CD19 and CD20, uh, which is very similar to uh, rituximab, another medicine that mm -hmm. is out. But uh, this one works more by blocking the, the cytokine that stimulates the prolonged life of the cell rather than destroying the cell. So this, uh, but for one reason, and for this reason, I think that it's also uh, a, a slower medicine mm -hmm. to be effective in terms of uh, stopping the, or slowing down the, uh, the progression of, uh, of the lupus activity. And this is that this, sometimes this medicine may take up to you know three months or, or so in many people. And so then if you're on this medicine, you're able to tolerate it uh, without getting the, the side effect with the most common side effect that I've had people with is, is fever, rashes, and headaches. Now those are, but both, many people are otherwise are able to tolerate it very well. Uh, now it's not only just the intravenous medicine, it can also come in an injectable form uh, which may be even more convenient for people that are on the go. So I think that this is, a, I wanted to, uh, just to reiterate about the, this medicine, that not just this medicine, but all the medicines we talked about, is these are all used to try to control various uh, conditions that, that lupus may, uh, patients may have. And so that the more aggressive medicines I like to use for more aggressive problems. If you have a, 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 a seizures or brain involvement because of this or kidney involvement because of this lung involvement that I would use more aggressive therapies those that are, are, are more mild and they and if you're able to tolerate the medicine I use more mild therapies you know like intermittent use of prednisone intermittent use of uh, nostrils like ibuprofen or naproxen or you know some others or that um, or, or hydroxychloroquine so that um, so that management of lupus I think is a lot many times based on the presentation and what how the lupus is affecting that, that individual patient. So not everybody is the same and not everybody can tolerate every medicine. So we have to keep all of that in mind as well. Uh, I thank you for your uh, kind endurance of, of my talk. Thank you, Dr. Warren. The slides were just a little bit hard to see, but we, okay. we definitely have a lot of questions that are coming in for you. Okay. So thank you so much for your presentation, but let's see what questions we have here. Um, I'm a lupus patient. I've been on prednisone since 1997 till now. Should prednisone be used for, for a long time? Can you answer that? Uh, it, is that good? Yeah, that, uh, that depends because now that, I'm not sure what they're, why they're taking the prednisone, but if you're, I look at prednisone in, in this long duration of, and I don't know what the dose of prednisone is either, but the, the long duration of time, now we got to be careful that we don't um, get into trouble with some called adrenal suppression. In which case, if you were to suddenly stop prednisone in this situation, that uh, your, uh, your, uh, your adrenal gland is not able to uh, rapidly start ramping up uh, its own production of cortisol. And it turns out that cortisol is actually an important chemical in the, in the body in terms of managing your uh, uh, salt and water for, uh, uh, balance, also for uh, stress hormone, you know, so that, that, so in other words, if you uh, get excited, you don't have enough cortisol to, to maintain that uh, 
fight or flight response and your epinephrine is worn off, then you can uh, uh, actually have a, a loose consciousness for this. And I've, uh, I've had patient, I had one patient that did it twice and another patient that it was mistakenly mm -hmm. done to when they went to um, uh, for a surgical procedure. And I guess that the patient didn't uh, let uh, the surgeons know that uh, they were on the, whatever dose of prednisone they were on. But uh, fortunately that, uh, you know, that, uh, just passing by and they were uh, uh, having a code on the patient that I told them just give them a dose of cortisone and some uh, 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 normal saline and corrected the problem right off the bat. But it's just that, so it's, a, it's a, a thing that we do have to keep in mind because of that. Now, second, if there are, if the uh, lupus was not, um, easily controlled with other medicines or they are intolerant of other medicine or have contraindications, especially to like a, a mycophenolase or the a hydroxychloroquine or a, a, some of the other medications, then we do use prednisone because uh, hopefully we can use it as needed basis. But if there's, if something is a chronic issue, we, we continue to use it if you need it. So I don't want to uh, uh, discourage anybody from being on prednisone. I don't want you to just cold turkey it on your own. All right. Um, I have another question here. I have concerns of the side effects of Benlista. I've been yes. taking Benlista and I have a family history of heart issues, uh, CHF, COPD, and I have a heart murmur. I do mm -hmm. have side effects of being sick to my stomach and lightheadedness for the first two days. It does help somewhat, but however, the side effects and the family history concerns me. Um, well, I think that with all of our medicines, we have to be uh, 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 take other issues in, uh, into consideration because that uh, many people that may have lupus, but they may also have, you know, say diabetes, or they may have heart disease, or they may have uh, epilepsy, you know, some other issues that are going on or some hematologic issues like leukemia, lymphoma. We do have to keep all those th type of things in, in mind as well. But I think that uh, for, for me, I think that uh, I haven't had many people that had uh, cardiovascular events or, or side effects based on the, uh, or uh, on Benlista. Now, the, I've tend to see more of the, uh, like, uh, actually, I also don't see it much in the way of infection, even though I know that's uh, it's a, a slightly immune suppressing drug as well. But uh, I, Infection risk hasn't been that high for me for that. I think maybe one or two people, but that uh, but uh, everybody else has done very well that way. Uh, the uh, congestive heart failure, uh, we do have to be a, a, a especially concerned maybe with those that are in particular getting the intravenous form because you also get that volume of fluid that's there. But I think the injectable form is is not quite as big a risk for the congestive heart failure or uh, or a, a, a pulmonary involvement for that. So I think that uh, I, I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with Benlista unless you have uh, immune system or, or allergic reaction to it or something. So I think I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Okay. So another question, if my mom and dad have macular degeneration yes. and I have the gene, should I be taking Plaquenil? I think that uh, you're at, at definitely at higher risk you know, it, it turns out that the percentage is, 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 is like we're trying to point out, is that many people don't have that macular degeneration side effect within the first five years, uh, although that's the, according to the study. So uh, but I don't, I, as soon as you start taking the medicine, I like to get my, have your eyes done, uh, uh, exam within that, in that, within that year's time because of, uh, Sometimes the statistics is not the same for everybody. Just said, but that uh, I think that your risk for having macular degeneration is going to be higher just because you may get it naturally. It may not even be related to the uh, uh, to the uh, plaquenil, and so that uh, 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 there's a, what's called a, a senile or, or age-related macular degeneration. So I'm not sure how old your parents were, but they may have gotten it as they're they gotten older, and it may have not have anything to do with uh, plaquenil at all. But you are at higher risk for developing it on its own from, I mean, hereditary wise. Right. <clears throat> okay, this one's a little bit of a long one. Um, if there is a preferred medication to use, oh, excuse me, one second, did I? If there's a preferred medication to use to help get rid of Medrol, I've taken it for 10 years, usually one tablet a day. I've tried Celsep, methotrexate, and now I'm on Imuran. Okay. So is there any other preferred medication to take? 
other. Oh, I mean, it, instead of those other ones that you mentioned, that's what, probably what I mean. Oh, okay. This is that the, the, actually the it's uh, it's an individual thing because that the, uh, if you're taking the medrol because of like organ system involvement, then if you were to stop that uh, medicine or, and don't have anything else to replace it with, then I think that you're at, at risk for uh, uh, having progression of that. Uh, disease and now it turns out that there are other medicines. I only mentioned that like the, the common ones, but there are other medicines that that may be used or potentially used on an off-label basis that are used for the uh, for transplant rejection type medicines. Those are uh, sometimes used for this. Uh, the some and now if you're uh, using the uh, uh, the medrol because of uh, like musculoskeletal or, or arthritis type of uh, 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 symptoms then you may want to try the and if there's no contraindication sometimes we do use uh, anti other anti-inflammatory type medicines too uh, you do have to be careful because that uh, many of them have some of the uh, similar side effects like uh, atherosclerosis or hardening of the artery disease or uh, congestive heart failure and then maybe even kidney uh, uh, problems that you may not necessarily see with the med withdrawal so we do have to be careful and, and people are, are our, our patients are, are very individualized in terms of um, there's no real cookie cutter or, or way of trying to treat any uh, patient. You may have two patients that have the same disease but respond to different medicines. And it's that, uh, that the other one may not respond to or may have a side effect with a medicine that the other one doesn't have a side effect from. So it's, it's very individual. I don't, I don't know if I answered your question or not, but there's, uh, there are other medicines that are potentially used but uh, I'm happy to talk with your physician about those. Okay. All right. Well, there are other questions coming through, and for the sake of time and continuing to go on, maybe we can save some of these questions for the end, Dr. Warren. But thank okay. you so much for your presentation. Appreciate it. So we'll see. Uh, maybe at the end we can bring up some more.